Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very big welcome to this Discourse Cafe, um, in partnership with the Conrad Arnhaus Stifting, who is um, our supporters for all our predictions of the Institute Discourse Cafe. Um, so, very welcome. Yeah, I hope the bad weather hasn't deterred too many of our um, people who wanted to come. Um, just two practical um, things. First, I'll be sending um, lists around, so you can just write up your name and a few other details, um, which is just for the um, for our sponsorships. And secondly, if you need the bathroom, it's um, out and around, but it's quite a mission to get there. So just I've got the key and just ask me. Doesn't need. And um, and afterwards, we'll have some coffee and tea and snacks. Um, so. Please feel free to hang around for that. And I'd now like to ask Lefan and to introduce our two speakers. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's really a ple pleasure and a privilege for me to introduce our two speakers this afternoon. Um, I think it's, it's not every Wednesday afternoon that you have two people in the same room who are so well respected um, uh, in their fields and um, to have different contexts speak to each other as well. Jim Wallace is um, a public theologian and serves on many boards um, and forums in to voice his, his um, public theology. He has written, is an author, written many books, <coughs> New York Times best-selling author. His latest book is The Uncommon Good, which I'm sure he will speak to this afternoon. And um, he is, he's not, it's not his first time to visit South Africa, he has been here before. He's, it's his first time in Stellenbosch, however which we heard a little bit about earlier today when we had our chapel gathering here. Um, and I'm ho hoping you would refer to that again, Jim, um, in terms of what you have seen in the last 20 years developing in South Africa. Um, and I, we value your opinion on that. Then we also have our Dean of the Faculty of Theology, Professor Nico Kwapman, a very well-respected public theologian um, in South Africa, also heading up the Bayer Center for Public Theology. Yeah, it's situated at, at, at our faculty, um, and also very well respected for his work on ethics and public life. We want to give them both an opportunity to share their stories, their insights, their wisdoms, and then we would like to engage um, as an active audience and have ample time for questions and discussion. So I think without further ado, we'd like to invite perhaps if Jim. But if you would like to come up and, and share with us. Thank you very much. Yes, please. <laughs> well, uh, I, I just was thrilled a few moments ago because uh, Lewis showed me a picture of Bears Not Day when he was a student in 1939 out here. And Bears uh, was blessed to have him as a friend, and to see his picture as a student was a great, great gift, so thank you for that. Joy Carroll, my wife here, is uh, one of the first women to ordain the Church of England. Uh, many years ago, my son Luke and Jack, two boys, and uh, Joy spoke in Durban on, on Women's Day, and uh, I, I shared the story that the Greenbelt Festival where we met in the UK is an arts festival, music, social justice, and we met there, got married and came back. Years later, and my son, who is now six feet tall, was only four years old. And he was sitting on my lap watching Joy lead worship and celebrate the Eucharist for 20,000 young people. And Luke looked up at me and said, Daddy, can men do that too? <laughs> So I tell that story to say that the ordination of women in the Church of England changed the conversation. And I want to suggest that uh, prophetic faith always changes the conversation, uh, the public conversation. This whole issue of personal faith and public life has preoccupied me my whole life. And uh, it's, the, it's the conversation I'm still in today. And maybe I could just briefly share my own story of that, because finally our faith is about stories, our own stories. We said in the chapel how 
faith is contextual because the incarnation is the unique part of Christian faith. And for me, the incarnation is in Jesus Christ, God hits the streets. So what's a street test of our theology? So for me, I was raised, uh, some of you might know the Plymouth Brethren. And I was raised a Plymouth Brethren kid. My parents started that church, and they were getting concerned about me because I hadn't been saved yet. And I was six years old, getting up in years. I was six, an unsaved kid. So we had a preacher come in, a revival preacher on Sunday night, and all the unsaved kids had to sit in the front row. You notice never anybody in the front row except the guests, because the closer you are to a sermon, the more impact it might have on your life. <laughs> so he was preaching, this revival preacher, very fiery as he had been advertised, and it seemed to me like he pointed his finger right at me when he said, if Jesus came back tonight, your mommy and daddy would be taken to heaven, and you would be left all by yourself. It got my attention. <laughs> And I realized at six, I have a five-year-old sister to support. <laughs> so I wanted to repent of the degradation of my first six years, which was substantial in my case. Uh, and I asked my mother how to fix this thing. She told me of the love of God for me. God wasn't wrath, it was love. God wanted me to be God's child, so I signed up. It was my first conversion as an evangelical. Evangelicals need many conversions. And it was my second conversion that was the most decisive. Now I'm 14 years old, a teenager in Detroit, Michigan. I'm now listening to my city, reading the newspapers, hearing the news, having conversations. I begin to ask these questions. Why did we live the way we did in white Detroit? When life seems so different, just a few blocks or miles away in black Detroit. I was hearing about unemployment, hungry families, people in jail, things I didn't know anything about. I heard there were black churches, black Plymouth Brethren churches. I heard nothing about, never had a black preacher. They told me a song, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in sight. Jesus loves little children of the world. In my sight, they're only white people. The, answer, the responses I got to my questions were, you're too young to ask these kinds of questions. When you get older, you'll understand. Or we don't know why it's this way either, but it's always been this way. The only honest answer I got was, if you keep asking these kinds of questions, you're going to get into a lot of trouble. And that proved to be true. So I began to go into the city, the inner city, and I would just walk around and listen and meet people. I took jobs with young guys my same age, but they're black and I was white, and I learned that we grew up in different countries in the same city. And the black churches took me in, a white kid who had all kinds of obvious questions, but they were very patient and took me in. I came back one day to my church, and a church elder took me aside and said, Jim, you have to understand, uh, Christianity has nothing to do with racism. That's political. Our faith is personal. That's political. Our faith is personal. I was only 15 years old. That's the night that I left the church in my head. In my heart, because if the if the the thing that was that was consuming my heart and my mind, the thing that seemed so wrong with my something was terribly wrong in my world, and nobody was talking about it, as if it didn't exist, and I was <coughs> preoccupied with this problem, and they said this issue had nothing to do with my faith, nothing. It was about me and the Lord, not about the world. And so I said, well then, if, if my faith has nothing to do with this thing that is consuming my, uh, my life as a young man, then I want nothing to do with my faith. 
So I left. I joined the civil rights movement, student movements of my generation. We could put 10,000 people in the street in about two hours' time back in those days. First time I was, uh, I met the police, and beat up and tear gassed and put in jail, all of it. I learned all that in those years after leaving church. So my conversion that changed my life was, was a conversion that took me out of the churches. But I was reading Karl Marx, Che Guevara, Ho Chi Minh, all that, and it wasn't satisfying. It didn't go deeply enough, and I somehow, though I had left the church, or they left me, I never got shed of Jesus. So I began on my own to go back and study the New Testament. Book of Matthew. I found the Sermon on the Mount, which I had never heard a sermon on in my white church. Ever. The Sermon on the Mount was used as a catechism for the early church. It was about the inbreaking of this new order called the Kingdom of God, which changed everything spiritually, socially, economically, <clears throat> politically. The Beatitudes are this upside down kingdom of our values. Reverses everything. I'd never heard that before. But I got to what became my conversion text. 25th chapter of Matthew. Now, many young people are leaving churches in my country because churches they feel are so judgmental. No grace, no love, just judgment. And the New Testament is not full of judgment, except it is in this passage. Son of man is sitting in judgment, sheep and goats, on the nations. And here's what he says. I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was naked. Naked means stripped of everything, dignity, everything, naked. I was a stranger, immigrant. I was sick. I was in prison. And no one came to see me. You didn't feed me. You didn't give me anything to drink. And all the people there, I noticed, thought they were his disciples. And they said, Lord, when do we see you? Hungry. Thirsty, naked, sick, stranger in prison. When did we, we didn't know it was you. And he says, as you've done it or not done it, for the least of these, you've done it to me. It's a passage of judgment. And he's saying, I'll know how much you love me by how you treat them. That passage was and is my conversion passage. I said this morning, I've learned most about the world when I've been in places where I wasn't supposed to be or with people I wasn't supposed to be with. When I was here in the 80s at the invitation of Bears in the day, that's why I came. I was in uh, Belleville and uh, Nietzsche and, uh, uh, I wasn't. I, I was in the places where I wasn't supposed to be and that's how I learned what I learned about South Africa uh, with people I wasn't supposed to be with. Now, to me, this, this is the, um, the key to our conversion, particularly if we are from places where life is lived in a bubble. Uh, I was just with, with, with a pastor just now at a wine tasting, beautiful, beautiful place, gorgeous place. And uh, he's a pastor here, and he says, uh, he says, Stellenbosch uh, is beautiful. Every time I come back, I tell my wife, remember, this is a bubble. This is a bubble. What does it mean to put our faith into the streets in the real world where we live? Now, in the two weeks I've been here, I had the blessing to be thrust into the anti-apartheid struggle uh, as a young man. And Bears asked me to come, and I couldn't because I was on all the security lists of your government. I couldn't get in. So World Vision snuck me in, because they had this visiting pastor's list that wasn't checked. So I snuck in, and I got to Desmond Tutu and all of their bears, and Alan Busak, I lived with him here in French County. And so I got to be with the leaders of your churches, who really were the heroes, the Degruchis and the stories, and the people that you know so well. Uh, as a young man, now I'm an older guy, now I'm here with a new generation 
of young leaders. Uh, well, I admit it, now your seminaries, universities, and, and in some of your townships already. And what I'm hearing, I'd love to hear this now from you, um, the mission of ending apartheid was one of the most dramatic missions <clears throat> in the world that I was blessed to be a little small part of. But for an older generation, there is a sense of mission accomplished. The younger generation is not sure. And for people I'm meeting, it's mission continued. Apartheid is a very painful target, but an easier target. Easier target. Now you're fighting what we're fighting. Mass unemployment. Education, which doesn't teach. Schools are early prisons that imprison young people and take away their chance for a future. Drugs, I, I, I was talking to a young church worker t today. She gave 40, 12, 13 year old kids from around here, brown kids, white t-shirts, paint whatever you want. And they painted American flags all over. Is that, what, Hollywood? Movies? No, nah, they admire our gangs in, in, in the US. They want to be American gangsters. I've worked with gangs all over the U.S. Gangs happen when there's no work, family, or education. No. So you've got many issues we have now. You know. uh, mass incarceration. We have now the highest rate of the imprisoned in the world. You were number one before. Now we're number one. 25% of the prisons in the world are in the U.S. 6% of the population in the world. Overwhelmingly black and brown. So a whole movement's be beginning now. So now the churches, we're beginning social movements, and I'll just say this, and I'll turn over to my, my colleague here. Uh, we have to remember that uh, the difference between movements and governments. ANC was a movement. Now it's government. That's different. Very different. My experience here and around the world is social movements are what change politics. The outside changes the inside. The common good, which is Ubuntu in your language, we're, I'm not human apart from my brother. We're not ever human by ourselves. Uh, outside the bubble, who is my neighbor means those outside the bubble. <clears throat> the common good never originates within power. Washington, D.C. It's got to come from outside. It was Martin King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement that made, the black churches made the Civil Rights Movement possible. They were the infrastructure. So now we're doing that around immigration, 11 million undocumented people. We're moving, supporting them, and changing incarceration. But we have to fight, we have to fight all these politics. I've been arrested outside the White, White House many times and met on the inside with the President of the United States. But you have to, what does integrity mean in both places? If you're meeting with the president on the inside, you have to have a movement on the outside, but you won't have any impact on the inside. So I'm now curious how a new generation in this country wants to see the mission here continue. This morning I talked about the young man from Sing Sing, prison who was converted and, and, and he wanted to stop the train that brought him to that prison. And I said, what trains do you want to stop? And a young woman afterwards said, uh, that really got to me, the whole train, stopping trains. Now, I want to stop the train of gender violence in South Africa. What are the trains that have to be stopped? Christians don't just ride the trains or find safe trains to ride. You know, we stop the trains and turn trains around. That's what the conversion means. My, my personal faith, I mean, uh, the words I didn't have before that elder spoke to me, I, did, I do do now. When he said, uh, you know, Christianity and racism, nothing. I said, now I say this, God is personal. This God knows everything about everybody in this room and wants a relationship with us anyway. God is personal but never private. That's the key. God is personal but never private. What does it mean to take our personal faith to the streets in the world? Private atonement is the gospel I was raised with. 
is a biblical heresy. The Testament teaches the gospel of the kingdom as a new order that breaks into the world to change the world and us with it. The world and us with it. I have to do that in my context. Theology is contextual. Peter Marisberg, I was there last week. Unjama movement. Contextual theology. Your colleagues are all there. And they are trying to understand what that means there. So I was sharing what it means in our context. They were sharing what it means in their context. And together we learn from each other. So I want to hear what all this means in your context now, here, in this new era, mission continued. And what a new generation. A new generation in South Africa is going to try to make the country what both Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela want to be, a different kind of country. What does that look like for a new generation here? That's what I'm eager to hear from you and learn about while we're here. Okay, good afternoon, uh, brothers, sisters, ladies, gentlemen. Can I also say very welcome to you, Jim? You are at home here in the faculty. It's was a privilege that you and your family and colleagues are visiting South Africa, and that you also came to visit Stellenbosch University, and specifically this faculty. And I want to thank Leslie van der Wey at the Francel Slaver Institute, together with the students, uh, also Louis, uh, that you could arrange it that we have this session with Jim this afternoon. Uh, so you must uh, uh, forgive us, but in South Africa, part of the Ubuntu spirit is really, we normally get, you know, praise singers first, praise singers. Uh, so the, the idea of, you know, to, 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 to affirm our joy that you are here. Uh, we will give you an opportunity later. Uh, we have some of your books here, which we read, and you must just sign it for us also. Uh, we really appreciate your, your work. And what I will do, Jim, is to make a few remarks that will pave the way for the discussion uh, from the audience. And Louis specifically asked me to, to speak from my own biography and from our context. Uh, and uh, I will gladly do that, but also then be in dialogue uh, with you. Um, I am so glad to see here some of my colleagues today, and I mention them because I, my own story is intertwined with theirs. I have classmates of mine here from my student years at Western Cape University, mm -hmm. Alan McMaster here in front, Derek Mato, another classmate there, and Alex Fisher, another classmate here. And then I have a colleague, Robert Foster, there with whom uh, the two of us together wrote a book. Uh, so I just refer to them uh, to say that these people are, are, are people who helped to form my own narrative and my own biography, together with the younger ones whom you see in here. Sorry guys that I don't put you in the younger category anymore. <laughs> but the younger ones here, Leslie, uh, in, in the, amongst the younger ones, and you will see many others, uh, here, Helen Ney, uh, all of them, Mahrit, uh, our students who, continuously rewrite my own story and challenge my story. But it's a story that is informed by what I, what I think is in the heart of your work. You know, when I, uh, I, I remember when you were here those years, and I, especially via Alan Busak, could discuss your work, and Alan was here for three years, and uh, we drank from your wells, and then, uh, but, uh, what is important from reading your books through the years, uh, amongst others the ones that you must sign a bit later, uh, you help us with three things that we try to do in, 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 in our work in public theology. And the first thing that we try to do is to say, uh, let us rediscover the inherent public nature and public contents of our faith. And this is for us so crucial. After the years of struggle against apartheid and clear public visibility and presence, it's crucial to think about 
our public presence in a new context, mm -hmm. in a context of saying we're not just fighting against something anymore, but we must now embody the, the post-apartheid vision that we had cherished. Mm -hmm. You know, together with the colleagues uh, whom I mentioned here, we once launched the United Democratic Front, which was launched in Alan Busak's initiative especially, and there Alan was the main speaker the day and he said the vision for a post-apartheid South Africa is we want one united, undivided, non-racial, non-classist, non-sexist, democratic South Africa and in his typical voice, where peace and justice reign supreme. Then he said, we want all our rights and we want them here and we want them now. And we, three o'clock in the morning, you could wake a student and we could say the vision. <laughs> but we could recite it. But now it's time to embody it. Yeah. And in this context, it's then so crucial that we say, let's drink from our wells. And the first thing then is to say, our wells, the Christian faith, has an inherent public content. It's important that when we say we baptize a child, that we say this is an affirmation of dignity. And the, the life of this little girl cannot be injured by sexual trafficking. Mm -hmm. And this little boy, his life cannot end up in a jail. Mm -hmm. So that's very public. And to help to remind churches, pastors, laity, that this is our faith, like you just said, now it's personal, but very, very public, not private. Baptism has implications for the life of this child. And then secondly, that we also, and this we find helpful in your work as well, that our faith is a reasonable faith. Uh, you don't have to commit intellectual suicide to be a Christian. And we see how you in your work engage different disciplines, different sectors of life. It's so interesting. You, we look at the various issues that you deal with in public life, but that you deal with it in a way where you strive to make Christian convictions as far as possible intellectually accessible to audiences within and outside the faith community. And, and this is for us a big challenge. It's, and maybe when we discuss, you can say more about that, but that we can say faith helps us to understand the public challenges better. At one point you're talking about a, a radical approach and you then say radix means to go to the root of the thing. And to really say we can use faith convictions to discover what is underlying the problems that we see in society. So in that sense then that faith helps us to make intellectually better sense of of the challenges that, that, that we face. That's a, a second uh, a major thing in, in, in uh, aspect uh, with regard uh, to which you really help us. And the, the last thing is then the public implications of our faith. To say, think through it. If you have various challenges, uh, uh, um, how does faith really help us to address racism, to address corruption, to uh, address the many, many challenges that we face. So, with regard to the three things, but you also now when you spoke said, uh, it's crucial that we do it in your ways. Uh, we are in, a, in the context of a democracy now. And two of the things that we have to do is to ask, first of all, how do we do it together? Stellenbosch University is one of the together spaces in this country. And together spaces, gym, are the most difficult spaces. There's a sense in which it was easier to say, they are there, we are here. We were at UWC, white people at Stellenbosch, and we could deal with each other. But now we have to do it together. And my colleague Llewellyn McMaster, after our rector died tragically, wrote a great article in the African Sunday newspaper reflecting about the together spaces in which we function mm -hmm. and saying that in that spaces you, you are pressed. Some say you're too progressive. 
others say you're selling out. Uh, and and, and it, it's, it's true for black people, colored people, in the together spaces, but it's also true for white people who say we're going to function in the together spaces. You are stigmatized from, from various sides. So uh, that is a new thing for us. That's a big challenge for us. We were experts in diverse and apart. Hey, but we must learn regarding diverse and together. And 20 years later, we had made progress, but, but there's still a lot to learn and a lot of skills to acquire. And the last remark that I would like to make, Jim, uh, is that you, uh, we also have to learn how to be present in public life in, in new ways together but also in new ways. Uh, people often accuse churches and theology that we are not present in public life as we were during the struggle years. And then they mean that we are not prophetic enough. Mm. And then I think they mean that we're not proclaiming the vision of a new society enough, and that we especially, I think they mean especially, that we're not critical enough, that we're not offering public criticism adequately. But the challenge is to say, is public, is prophetic speaking perhaps not broader than just spelling out of the vision and offering criticism? Isn't it also about telling the narratives of hope and suffering? Isn't it about doing hard work economic analysis? And isn't prophecy also, shouldn't it take form in the mode of policy? as I see you doing. So it's not, they're not the case of either prophecy or policy, but rather prophecy <coughs> is policy. We're struggling with these questions. And, 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 and then the churches, I think, is, is, is present in, are present with regard to their priestly work. They, mm -hmm. If you go into the townships every Sunday, people, the, the churches are present throughout the week and on Sunday. So in a sense, there's a priestly presence, presence of churches doing work of healing, being amongst the poor and oppressed, the AIDS victims. The, uh, so in a sense, then, a new way of looking at, at, at our public presence, and that it is prophetic presence in a broader sense than just criticism and envisioning, and also present in priestly style, but also being present in, lastly, the royal servant style, where we say we work hard to be, on the one hand, faithful disciples and responsible citizens. Mm -hmm. People seeking the common good that you're referring to, uh, to, to in, your, in your work. So, Jim, this is for us the context in which we are, and from the brief comments that I made, uh, we, 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 we want to say uh, we're seeking new ways of doing theology, new ways of being faithful in new contexts, but I think from the floor people can make the inputs. Your presence at Stellenbosch helped us, and in your book you, you said that new thinking leads to new acting. Mm -hmm. And our deceased director said one of his major aims was to say, also via von Sales Lover Institute to develop thought leaders. And thank you for also helping us to say thinking sessions like this will impact on, on, on behavior and will enhance transformation and renewal. So uh, it's very helpful. Uh, very helpful. In, in, in brief. Yeah, very helpful. Um, we'll open the floor for questions now. If anyone would like to ask a question to either one or both of our speakers. Don't be shy. Can I, <laughs> uh, just before you ask, you know, uh, if uh, we're not going to accept uh, that there's not going to be discussion. When I was in, in matric, uh, final year of school in South Africa. You know, we read a well-known Afrikaans artist with the name N.P. van Beek uh, his book Raka. Mm. And then uh, 
uh, every student had to prepare a piece and the teacher would ask you in class to read it first. And so uh, in the day one of our classmates read it and when he finished he was sitting quite relaxed and we had the sense that the guy was not prepared but he was sitting, he just read it beautifully. So the teacher later to say, Joseph, he said, yes ma'am, uh, please do an exposition and pose some questions. And then he said, oh, sorry, I thought what Van Weidlow said was so good. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't accept it then and we won't accept it today. <laughs>
women's issues, climate, where does climate fit on that? And I said, that's, the, that's entirely wrong analysis. Take any issue we care about, women, migration, water, food, climate change impacts all of the other issues. It makes them more problematic. And I went through Matthew 25, a new way for me of thinking about that text, was climate change. You know, I was hungry. Climate change will make more people hungry. I was thirsty. Water. I, I, would, I was naked. I was stripped. I was an immigrant. So climate is impacting all the issues we care about. It's not another issue. It's an issue that, that impacts everything else that we care about. Now the good news is that the younger generation uh, uh, is much more sensitive to this. The problem is we have a time window problem on climate change. As we just don't have generations to figure this out. So the tension we have as a new generation is, I think, winning on this, but the time frame is narrowing on climate change. And the opposition to it is political. It's political. So in the U.S., you have a Republican Party that has made this a part of their orthodoxy to oppose anything about climate change. In fact, to disbelieve in climate change. And it's not even really, um, it's not a scientific argument. There is no scientific argument. It's just a political platform to defeat Democrats. So the good news is, there is in the U.S. and around the world. I'm going to Zimbabwe for a few days, in a, in a few days, to look at the impact of climate change in Zimbabwe. Uh, and I'm going there just to kind of look and listen and learn. But I think this is one of the critical trains, if you will, from my chapel uh, remarks, a train we have to stop. It's one of those trains we have to stop. So I think seeing this as, as not finally a scientific issue just, or a political issue, but this is for us really a, a matter of faith. This is a Genesis issue about what it means to be stewards of God's good creation. The evangelicals at home who've been converted on this call this creation care. That's their language. It's creation care. How do we care for God's, God's creation? So I'm hopeful. We pulled together all the evangelical environmental groups for a retreat last year. Very powerful, and we have a number of scientists who are Christian scientists teaching in schools, and they formed a whole new organization as Christian scientists, and now they've given up given a public voice. We do all their media work, and they're a new voice as Christians and scientists speaking on behalf of climate change as a moral issue. So I think uh, we have a lot of work to do because of the time frame, but I think the theology now. I think you change, this is a funny thing, I, I think that you change, change uh, public issues by starting with good theology. You have to do a good theological narrative. Uh, you can't just start with the issue and the policy and the data. You've got to do a theological narrative. And out of that comes the moral narrative for building a movement. You have to change the moral conversation around something to change the politics. So you can't take their political framework as your starting point. You've got to uh, re uh, reconfigure it theologically, I think. Do good theology first, and then out of that, create a moral narrative for a political movement. But I think you're right. That's a critical issue. Thank you. I'll turn to the next question. We listed the same line from earlier. You, as Ryan, and I, unfortunately, had uh, coffee. But that's a different conversation. Uh, can I ask about the d divide in South Africa between uh, rich and poor, the haves and the have nots? Now, I'll give a background to it, and I'd love to hear uh, also Professor Kofi what you think. I was fortunate enough to teach a class of engineering students with the final year of 2020. We spoke about some of the social challenges in South Africa. And there were two clear streams, very strong. Uh, one that we should keep things more or less as they are. Uh, and the second thing that said, what we do, we do not do properly. Uh, so we should either refigure or not do anything at all. What do you think are some of the questions that we should ask in this country? Well, and even across uh, the globe, I'm glad that Daniel can join us now. A 
because you know, what are some of the questions that we should ask uh, when it comes to you know, us addressing this dire um, difference and divide between uh, rich and poor? I think I'll maybe kick off, um, basically just on the previous thing of the ecological challenges, I think, um, Tim, the way you, you, you uh, phrased your response to say how it is intertwined with every issue that we face uh, is, is crucial for us in the, in the work that we do uh, to really help with the process of conscientization. Mm -hmm. I, I think we should uh, uh, address the, the ecological challenge with the same passion that we try to address the economic and the racial and the sexual and, and, and other challenges. It, 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 it is really, uh, and to mainstream it, not to see it as something there at the margins. Leslie poses a question on, on, on a crucial challenge for us. Uh, we always wished we could uh, share Brazil's soccer I mean the Brazil before this World Cup now. Uh, Brazil soccer skills and, and, and everything. <laughs> uh, but we are with them champions uh, uh, regarding the gap between the rich and poor in the world that we really are one. Uh, we are one of the countries with the biggest gap between the rich and poor. And to address that uh, inequality, I think it's important. I, I find the work of, of John Calvin helpful in this regard mm -hmm. to say mm -hmm. that we that we don't go for a type of equality which implies uh, that there are totally no differences between people. People have different talents, people have even different levels of dedication, and our work ethic is not exactly the same, and our opportunities are not the same, and the environments in which we grow up are not the same. So there are forms of, 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 of of inequality, but the important thing for Calvin is that we must work for what he calls equitas, and it's translated in English with equity. Uh, and the close word is the idea of equilibrium, that we have higher levels of equilibrium, balance in, 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 in our society, so that some don't have too much and others too little. So in a, in a certain sense, I think that especially rich people listen more attentively to you if you start talking the, le uh, the language of acknowledging the talents of people, their entrepreneurial skills, uh, safeguarding their freedom to develop within the constraints of what is ecologically also morally acceptable. But, but to say <coughs> develop, uh, we, we need our entrepreneurs. Uh, I would think, and, and, and it's for me interesting in, 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 in black communities, we now also, that's also new for us as theologians, we also now have an increasing number of black entrepreneurs, and we, they come with us to questions like, you guys are experts in the gospel, is good news to the poor, is there no good news for the rich as well? And that, that, that's a, a challenging question, but I think the notion of uh, of, of, of equilibrium helps in this regard and but then to say to say let us do three things um, develop an ethos on the one hand of compassion to say we, we are called to, to, to share uh, what we have secondly to continue visiting on a structural level whether the economic structures and arrangements and call it models that we have in place, whether they sufficiently serve the cause of, of equity, of justice, of a, a, a life of dignity for all, whether uh, it really serves the common good. And thirdly, uh, I think we need to work for an ethos of, of sacrifice, and that's not famous language, but mm -hmm. Mahatma Gandhi told us, live simply so that others may simply live. And, and, and we, need, we, we need to do that. But here, it, last night, I spoke here at the meeting of the two presbyteries, Uniting Reformed Church, Dutch Reformed Church, Presbyteries of Stellenbosch, met in France. Who, and the interesting thing is how people 
come with a question, but help us, help us to start giving more body to what you mean by justice. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is for us a challenge then also, I think, in theology and in engineering and in different disciplines. What are, and you cannot give one answer, but in specific situations, what is justice? One day a student in one of our classes here, in the together spaces here at Stellenbosch, the, the white student said in that class, fifth year Masters of Divinity class, I study with my black uh, classmates, and I know I drive here with my car, and things are going well with me. I'm not stink rich, but things are going well with me. But then I know some of my classmates struggle <laughs> to get something to eat every day. And I know this ain't right. And then he addressed the class, but please help me. What is my calling in this specific situation? There was a silence in the class. We of course could not just throw in the answers, but I think he posed a question that, that paves the way that would help us forward. Uh, so there's just some remarks. I'm, I'm struck by the reminder of Calvin there. I want to go back to my Calvin. Equity and equality are different concepts. Daniel Milano, I mentioned your name before. I didn't know you were here. My colleague from the business school here and from Davos. Uh, I, I, am, I am quite intrigued these days. And, Daniel knows our Council on Values is one of the most um, popular <laughs> because there's a there's a hunger even in the among the business people there for a new conversation about values. Uh, when we had the crisis in 2008, uh, 2009 Davos in January was they were really panicked, and while until then people like myself or Mohammed Yunus were speaking, but at 7 a.m. on the fourth floor. Now we were in the plenary session, because there was this crisis going on. And they had a panel called The Market and, Value and Values. Tony Blair was on the panel, and he said to me afterwards, he said, they must be in crisis. <laughs> that a panel on the market and values, and ask you to speak, they must be in crisis. <laughs> but I said, what do you do when the invisible hand, Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, invisible hand, the invisible hand lets go of the common good. Let's go of the common good. People in the finance industry say to me, when we in the finance industry are 12 to 15% of corporate profits, then we are facilitating productive capitalism. Now we are 47% of corporate profits, and that's bad. Money's making money from money, not products and services that are necessary. So I love the young entrepreneurs at Davos who see business as a problem-solving enterprise. We want to be entrepreneurs who solve problems. Mohammed Yunus in Bangladesh, in his book, Social Business, he's using business to solve problems around water, mortality, and, and I remember he and I were doing a, a plenary before the CEOs one time, and he had them in his hand, because here it is, making payroll, businesses making profits, succeeding. Uh, but then he said, however, when we <clears throat> make a profitable business, we take those profits and pour them back into a new business, so you don't have the executive compensation you're used to. And he said, oh, time for lunch, time for lunch. You know? So what are the obstacles, for example, uh, the, the CEO at PepsiCo, who we've become friends with, Indian woman, wanted to do 50% of their beverages as healthy and reach out to the poor around the world. But the stockholders gave her trouble, pushed back. This might cost us some money. Now, some of those stockholders are stockholders in the company for used to be several years, now it's six weeks, two months. They're, they're hedge fund guys who are just look, using the market like a casino. 
a gambling cas cas casino. So even at Davos, these questions are now being talked about. So how do you, how do you, um, uh, I remember the, f the first time they had faith leaders at Davos for the first time after 9-11. I think they thought, gee, this 9-11, this religious problem might affect our, our investments. Let's bring in some religious leaders <laughs> to talk together. And then I went the second year and I said, why are we talking just to each other? We should talk to the other people who are here. So they sent me out to talk to these, group, these CEOs about that the topic was, um, should we despair of our disparities? Because inequality is now greater in South Africa than it was before. In the US, we have 400 people in the US, 400 wealthiest people make more than 150 million people. 400, 150 million. Uh, executive salaries to average worker salaries in, in, in the last 30 years in the U.S. have gone from 30 to 1 to 515 to 1. 515, now, however, however there ought to be a reward for uh, skill and faith and, and work, 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 work ethic, it's not 515 to 1. So at some point, the gap in equality is a religious problem, not just poverty. Not just poverty, inequality. The biblical notion of, econ of economy, I would say, is there is enough if we share it. God doesn't mind prosperity when it's being shared. So I had these CEOs and I said, I know you're all experts as CEOs in a topic that I love, which is biblical archaeology. <laughs> and they all laughed, and I said, well, here's what I've learned from biblical archaeology. When the archaeologists dig down the ruins of ancient Israel, they find periods of time that show a relative sharing of prosperity. Not an equality, but a relative sharing of prosperity. During those times, there were no prophets. No prophets. They weren't needed. Other times they dig down, like the 8th century, and find great disparities in the artifacts. That's when the prophets rise up to thunder the justice and judgment of God. God doesn't like inequality. Mm. And right now, it's the greatest it's been in our mem memory. This, this is, I say, bad for business, because it undermines a sense of belonging. The system seems rigged. It seems unfair, because people want to be successful. So I met a young entrepreneur in uh, Claremont Township last week. His name is Sufiso, and his name means, I'm told, a wish. And he and his young comrades are creating something called, I love, love this, wake up and do something. And it's economic activity, and Diaconia is helping to sponsor this, where they're doing gardening in the community, making beads, and also blocks and bricks. Young men, young, and they are, I'm not sure if they know it, but they are entrepreneurs. And they want to be successful. But they want to believe they can succeed. And if they run into infrastructures, and they run into barriers and blockages that show them the system is rigged, why would they trust the system? Why would they try? Then they'll go into other kinds of markets and activity. So, so I think inequality, too much inequality, is even bad for business. And there are business people who think that too. So this is where we in the faith community, I said change the conversation. The way you discuss inequality and, and equity equality, this is how we theologically can have this conversation. So I would think between a business school and a theological faculty, this is where we have these conversations. So we have to understand that these issues are not only public issues, but they're for us matters of faith. So how do we connect? And whether the people are faith people or not, if we're making sense about the common good, then they'll say, that makes sense. I was able to give the closing remarks at Davos this past year, and I was astounded how much people wanted to uh, respond, whether they were religious or not. And they all want to come up and they say, we have a cup of coffee and talk about this, and I call them my Davos confessionals. <laughs> because 
They want to bring these things, as Daniel knows so well, back into their context. How do I apply this back in my business environment? So our little committee on values tries to help people figure out how they can do that. It's wonderful to see you, my friend. Um, uh, yeah, I, I'm very interested in, um, I mean, to listen to your testimony, I have to call it testimony of your life, and, and so on, and um, the particular role that the Bible played from the very start, you know, and I'm, I guess throughout this we read your, your, your books and so and, 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 and I was thinking, you know, it is... I just related my own story about, I also had the, the privilege of having a discourse cafe, thanks to Leslie, <laughs> and, and they're writing the story. And I said to um, the student who came to interview me that one of the things that, that stand out for me in my own life is that I, I became involved not because of my reading of Marx or you know any other ideology or whatever, right. but my reading of the Bible. Right. And I think that um, um, in, in the time when we studied also, 70s, 80s, um, it was this going to the Bible and reading it, you know, through our own lenses. Given the fact that, you know, we had a gospel brought to us and we were not satisfied what we heard and, and the message uh, proclaimed, but... Uh, and Busak and leaders like Black and Reform, you know, right. mm -hmm. uh, liberation theology, the Kairos document, all those things help us to say we actually refuse <coughs> to let go of this, the Bible as the Word of God. We will read it and we will interpret it, mm -hmm. and it helped us. Right. It helped us in situations where, once again, in the, in the spaces where you have to answer questions from both sides, as a security police telling you, hey, what you're doing is, is you know, uh, against the word of God, and right. it's the ANC, they take over, you're not even going to have a church, you're now starting to be a, uh, a pastor, but there won't be churches for you. And, and in detention, uh, comrades would say, hey, well then, you really believe in this Bible and this heaven story, isn't it just for white people, you know? Uh, they have the privilege here, and we suspect they will also occupy all the front seats, you know, up there. So you had to wrestle with, with this now. And, and, and I'm happy to say, after all these years in my life, the message of the Bible is still the one that helps me, even in the challenges of today, as you have also alluded to. And I think that is... While I'm thinking about it in the context of also our students sitting here and, and having had conversations, especially with students from the Dutch Reformed Church, you know, most white students who struggle with their church and, and the past and, and, and what they've been told, and some leave the church. So, my <coughs> whole life from Ellen Busa, Tutu, my own, and Nico, and our generations uh, struggle with it. It's actually a challenge to say to our young students and brothers and sisters, your challenge is now to read and reread the Bible rather than leave the church and in disillusionment of, of, of what the fathers told you and you find out this this things that we so it's it's just that that I pick up and inspire me also listening to you and reading um, uh, what you you're so busy with and, 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 and fearlessly you know standing the basis of your faith, so it's just more White slave owners in America use the Bible. Their misinterpretation of the Bible to justify slavery. Then they gave Bibles to their slaves. They gave Bibles to their slaves to keep them in submission. But the slaves found in the book their theology of liberation, they found Moses and Exodus and King, they used the Bible. Without the black churches, there never would have been a civil rights movement. It was the moral and spiritual infrastructure of the entire movement. And so the Bible was turned on its head. And, and, and uh, Plymouth Brethren, I would say, 
it's a good place to be from because it, it, it gave me a foundation that then, then I, I reinterpreted just in the way you're saying. I read all of Alan's books. You know, I knew Alan, I knew Alan before he was famous you know, a long time ago. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's all there in, in Alan's books. And, and uh, uh, how, but, but as you say, it's got to be done over and over again. <clears throat> and, and the one thing I've been concerned about, some people have said to me, and I've met them here, they've well, said, we haven't made the connections between all these political issues and our faith. Environmental issues, economic issues, political issues, and our faith. We haven't done that here. And I said, yes, you have. I have all the books in my shelf. You have. It's in the Gruch, in the Usak, in Kani, in Tutu. It's, it's all there. And some of the young people I, I've met haven't really accessed or connected to that that critical black theology that I encountered here and really helped to shape my theology. So some of the people I've met here, young people haven't haven't they've they've been disconnected from that somehow. I've been surprised by that because it's all there. It's it's in it's in all of Adam's stuff being he and bears, it's all here. Uh, and uh, so how do we reconnect in new ways with a new generation? How do we, because it's all here. And so how do people take it and then not just do, do everything the old ways, but how do then, what are the things that have to focus on now? That's, that's what I'd like to learn while I'm here. What you all are thinking now are your next steps for a South African future. But that's right. It's, we don't leave it. We we take it and uh, reuse it in new ways. Is it a new question? Can I just go just on this one, uh, Jay? Uh, the, I think it is what you're saying is that we we need to drink from all the wells we have. And, and the one thing, for instance, that uh, uh, I spoke in July at an international conference that we had on public, on, on black theology mm -hmm. uh, in, in Pretoria with colleagues from the United States, Britain, and South Africa, and other African countries, uh, to make the point that we, just to affirm what you were saying, that when we say we when we talk about notions like public theology, it should never be used as if it is in opposition to liberation theology, to black theology, to feminist or womanist theology. But uh, public theology, as we try to use it also uh, uh, at the Bayes Nodia Center, is to say this is a specific emphasis in theology. It's not a totally new theology that now replaces. Some people do use it in there say the others are outdated, we use this one. Now, I personally prefer that we say public theology is an emphasis in theology that reminds us of the three things that I was referring to earlier, the public contents of faith, the public rationality, and the public implications of faith. And black theologians are doing what I would call uh, a black public theology, uh, and then and, and we discuss that uh, at, at, at our conference or womanist public theology and people like Denise Ackerman would say she's doing a feminist public theology. So, and I think it's crucial that we try to phrase it in that way exactly in order to keep on drinking from the wells of, 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 the, of these various theologies, and I'm glad, Jim, that you emphasize it. If you go back and read those works, uh, the Takatsa Mofo Kings and, and these great black theologians, then we will be so poor in addressing the challenges that we face now if, if, if we don't drink from that well. So I like the idea of, phrase it even in this way, Go with Busak beyond Busak, or yeah. go with Bayes no dear beyond Bayes no dear. But let's drink from from those wells, and and, and and let's say 
they would have, I mean, Ellen, if you speak to him now, he would say, I expect you yeah. to go further than, than I did. If you're really faithful to what I've done, you will go further. Well, Ellen once took me to the uh, Synod, and it was uh, the Dutch Reform Synod, and the <coughs> colored and the black churches all three together. And he took me to the meeting, and I was the only American in, in, in the room. And they're working on the Belfar Declaration. It's like the Barman Declaration. <coughs> there's, a, there's a declaration here, a confessing church, a black confessing church, yeah. that was so resonant with the German confessing church, yeah. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And Ellen, we would talk half the night about Bonhoeffer and, and South Africa and all of the rest. And so he would, you know, what he was doing, what they were doing, you were doing, you were taking Bonhoeff from the Confessing Church in the German context, applying it to your context. And it was, it went around the world. That declaration went around the world, impacted the world. And my friend Wes Grammer Michelson, is the general secretary of, of the Reformed Church in America, he used the Belfar Declaration to do a confessing statement on racism in his American church. From here. He used Belfar in particular. So I was in the meeting where I saw this debate happening between Boussac and the Dutch Reformed Churches. And so it's public theology is just faith going public. Exactly. And governments don't want your faith to go public. Mm -hmm. They want to keep it private. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, okay, apartheid's over. We won, we're in charge. You go back to being church now. Yeah. <clears throat> Meaning keep your faith personal. Because if your faith goes public, you might criticize us. Corruption, not delivering services, uh, all kinds of things. So they want to keep your faith personal and private. And we must not let them do that. Our faith has to always go public. You were going to... So, it, um, to the, our time is almost up. Um, can I just get an indication of how many people would like to ask more questions? Okay, can we keep it really short? And we'll um, keep our answers shorter, okay. so you can ask more questions. Thanks, um, James. I think my question is almost a half of what I've been asked to Jesus, but let me just phrase it. I'm asking uh, to James specifically, can you assist us to leverage the what or to all those things that we, whether it's uh, in nature and in the environment, whether it's in the public sphere, etc. Can you help us to get that what ought to and what we know what should be uh, regarding public theology re relevance and the relevant academic critique to the two major life affecting spheres that inevitably affect us, and that's government and business, to have that posted on the table and that it can become a common theme as a common agenda when they address and it becomes also to us in um, the faith communities also as a golden thread. We know what needs to be done, but the one thing is there's government with policies and there's business with the funds. And it's almost like we don't want to touch that on that front, but we know what ought to be can assist us to leverage and get that on the table, both for government and for business, to get our agenda going. Maybe we should hear all, all the questions, yes, and then we can make a quick final comments. Hello, John. I'm Professor Kwekman. I think maybe you, understanding the context of Salamosh University, out of a student perspective, we obviously have the university to get a degree, go into the world, earn some money, but how do we... How do we cultivate a culture among students that leave university to make that impact on society that we spoke about? Because there isn't this culture among young people to make a difference. It's, some, it's kind of like something you realize when you're older in your life. I have to do something in this world now. Yeah, so just um, given, given the vision of the country, the National Development Plan, and that, that whole thing of making a bigger influence on society, from a young, a, a student's perspective. Thank you, Janus. Let me just step outside the camera. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Janus, I'm a student at Stanford, um, and I'm particularly interested in the role of theology, and then I guess particularly public theology and liberation theology, um, 
in addressing the conflicts in our world. And if you think about the conflicts in our world, probably the first one and the, the most important one that comes to mind is the one in Israel Palestine. And um, I'd like to hear your perspectives on how you think um, theology can contribute to the public conversation about that conflict specifically, um, specifically in the context of or when we've seen that um, simply calling for peace and calm from both, from both sides hasn't really um, had an effect. Some of you sit here, your perspective on that. Jim, I was as small as Jason when I drove you in the eighties. When you were in Cape Town. So I've got gray and you also got gray. <laughs> <laughs> I think mean, we, we still haven't seen it. So we still both look pretty good though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you want to know more about South Africa and what we think about it years <laughs> later. Um, but when Nico told me that you were coming, I said, I just want to listen to this man speaking again um, and ask you a couple of pertinent questions that brings up this question, which is not only about Palestine, but it's about Iraq and the re-entry of America into Iraq, um, what is happening in Russia, what is happening in Syria, uh, uh, just a quick brush of what is happening globally and how we need to be responding to that. I'd love to hear what you say about that. In the context of South Africa, I think 20 years later we are now almost crossing that bridge and we're now beginning to discover the depth of our diversity and we need to find the bridges to actually reconnect. I think we are discovering the depth of inequality and we need to find how we need to build a society that is equal. I think we're finding now the depth of um, what corruption really meant, what it did to us in the apartheid years and how it is manifesting itself now in these days. And it's much more open because there are newspapers and others that are speaking about it. And so we are living in very challenging times in South Africa, but we're also living in extremely exciting times in this country. And, and I'm very excited to theologically think through these things. And I'm not sure whether it should be public theology or liberation theology. I don't even know the titles any longer. Um, but I just think normal people thinking through this and talking about it more and more. It's those spaces that we create that is absolutely essential for us to cross those bridges that holds this country. But I think we're in exciting spaces. Um, and it's exciting to hear young people talk. In fact, we should have actually listened a little bit more to them this afternoon. It would be nice to just hear what they were saying or what they are saying. And I'm hoping that the congratulations to the group that brought this group together because I think this is exactly the types of discussions that needs to take place. But in addition to that, I think when we have these discussions, and I'm just making a general comment, this needs to be opened up to other groups as well. You know? um, and I don't think we need only to invite them, we need to actively bring them so that they become active participants in the dialogue. So it's a whole lot of bits and pieces that I put together when I now speak to you. In, in the 80s when we spoke, we spoke about, about our confession. And we were very excited about that. And we spoke about the work that Alan was doing in the early 80s and in the 70s. And we were going through all of that now. Now all of that has changed and the last year. Just as an outsider looking in for the last few weeks that you were here, I'd love to hear your comments about where we are 20 years ago. Um, I would perhaps just in light of your question and a lot of the different... <coughs> things that have been posed to address in seven minutes. Um, there are two other engagements that um, you're also invited to with Jim. Um, the one is on, on Friday morning um, for, for two hours at the warehouse in Cape Town. Just come ask me for the details afterwards. And the other is a public gathering on Saturday morning in Cape Town, which will also be a public forum discussion time for, for questions and answers. So if you don't get your questions answered over tea or right now, those are also invitations for you. Thank you. Can 
guys, perhaps, um, can we arrange that we give <coughs> a few minutes to Jim? We, uh, I think I will still be here. I can still uh, continue with the conversations. But in the seven minutes, Jim, if you don't mind, we would like to hear your Well, the first question and the last were similar, right? What are the issues now? And, and there are some issues that will be issues for all of us but in different contexts. And two have come up already today. One is this issue of uh, gender violence and gender justice is, is critical to a South African future, to a global future. Uh, Joy said in her talk the other night, I think I mentioned earlier, the old idea of give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day, Teach him the fish, he'll, he'll uh, uh, eat for a lifetime or sit in the boat and have a beer, she said. <laughs> but help enable a woman to own a pond and you'll feed the community. Uh, all the data shows if you want to end global, global poverty, empower women and girls. That's, so how, how do you, and in the churches, uh, we simply cannot solve these things unless we have all of the gifts of God's children on the table. So I think that's critical to the future. And I've been listening, Joe and I are listening a lot to women in South Africa, and it's an issue very much on their hearts and minds. Even this morning I talked to some women afterwards here, very much on their thoughts and minds. Uh, that's one. Climate change is another. Inequality is certainly another. Uh, but there will be particular issues. I, I was very touched by someone I met in Durban who's doing a whole project on land. Land is an issue for you in a different way than it is, is for us. I was learning a lot, listening to him about what it means to, to do land reform post-apartheid in South Africa. Uh, I was very, very much intrigued by, by that. Met an architect who, um, what's the market called? He the Warwick Triangle. The Warwick Triangle. The Warwick Triangle. He created a whole kind of marketplace for younger entrepreneurs who are being marginalized. But see, now there's more economic activity in that market than in the mall. You know? And as an architect, he helped to design that whole marketplace. So how do you make economic activity really accessible to the young men like I met at Claremont? Um, uh, how, how do, uh, so what are the, as I said this morning, what are the trains that have to be stopped? Trafficking is certainly a train. So what are the, and sometimes, you, you know, is we were so passionate about apartheid, but in some ways, as painful, as dangerous, as costly as it was, it was an easier target. It was, as they say, black and white. You know? Now, these are tougher, more complicated inequality. That's clear, but it's, so, so that's where I think the voices of a new generation here are critical. Um, when I go to Morehouse College, where Dr. King went to school, uh, leading black university in America, and I always have this experience. The young black, it's all a Morehouse man. You're, it's all men. I'm a Morehouse man, so you're the individual of Dr. King. And they take me aside and they say, these old civil rights leaders, all they want to do is talk about how well they knew Martin Luther King Jr., and how many times he came over for dinner, and, and, and how they did it right. And, you know, they want to sit around a campfire in here and sing Kumbaya with them. <laughs> and we want to make our own history for justice. So I think that generation, I'm very keen to listen to the born frees or those who are, you know, maybe they were born in the but they were still young people. You've come of age now as born free. And, and Alan would say what you're saying. He would say, you know, uh, build on what we did. But I don't even live here now, you know. <laughs> He's coming back, I think, here next month, right? Uh, so I'm very eager to see a new generation make their voice heard. I'm in my 60s now, but half of our audiences are under 30 all the time. And I've got senior staff, and the, the new chair of my board, was a student of mine at Harvard many years ago, now he's 30. He's chair of the board. You know? 
and after he shaped his life too. So I have, we have had, had got to get the voice of a new generation into the conversation. And you'll take different tactics and strategies and different issues. I think, I think more activism, Daniel, around corporate America. Uh, there's new, we focus, I focus too much on government. I think we can change things in business more by directing our energy there. I talked to a group of CEOs and NGOs in Washington, D.C. recently, and they're worried about the dirty minerals in the Congo, right? Minerals that make our cell phones. So I'm the lunch speaker, the, it's not a religious group, the spirit speaker over, over lunch to make them excited about their sandwiches, you know? And I said, take out your cell phones. No, I mean to take them out. They took them out. I said, this is your significant other. You spend more time with this now than anybody, anything else in the world. So Jesus asked this question, or a question asked of Jesus, who is my neighbor? Right? It's the Good Samaritan parable. So I read them that story. Who is my neighbor? A lawyer asked you. And I said this morning, he was a Washington lawyer, because I knew his tone of voice, you know. Who is my neighbor? And I said, whoever helped make this phone, whose ever life was impacted by making your phone, that person is your neighbor. Let's talk about turning supply chains into value chains. That's the conversation happening in business schools. Supply chains into the value chains. That's a whole different conversation Alan Busak had, right? So what are the new conversations that a new generation can raise up? And also, trust your context. Issues that are contextual for you are indeed your issues. They don't have to be American issues. They're your issues. So trust each other's context and learn from each other's context. Uh, two quick things. Uh, Iraq, Ukraine, Israel, Palestine. Uh, at the top levels of politics, there are no answers to these questions. John Kerry asked us if they asked if I would, we would help frame, frame the language for the new peace settlement between the Israelis and Palestinians. The framework. We never got to it. So we didn't do it. We, we never got to it. Because at a, at a level of leadership, uh, uh, it's impossible now. However, there are young Jewish settler kids who were born there who didn't go from Berkeley, California to take over the Middle East. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> they were born there, and they look down the hill, and they see a Palestinian village that's not getting water. They look at their own top of the hill where they have sprinklers and lawns and golf courses, and they say, something's wrong here. Those young Jewish settlers are talking to young Palestinians. That's where the future is going to be made, not at the top level. When the war in Gaza breaks out, you had a big march in Cape Town here. You have to ask the hard questions. Do we really believe that, that, uh, that Palestinian lives are less valuable than Israeli lives at 100 to 1? Do we believe that? Are we going to criticize Hamas for not believing in a two-state solution when Netanyahu blocks that every day of the week? So it's a matter of telling the truth in hard situations. ISIS in Iraq happened because of a U.S. invasion of Iraq. And church leaders told them, uh, the Vatican told them, we told them, if you do this invasion, you'll increase terrorism. We told them, they didn't listen, and the U.S. is directly responsible for this terrible breakout of ISIS now, where you mentioned baptism, a church lead leader in Iraq told how a young boy he baptized was cut in half last week. A little boy cut in half by ISIS. A little boy cut in half. That's what we're facing now because of failed occupation, war occupation policies on the part of the U.S. So ask the hard questions about how to resolve conflicts in a different way than bombing everybody you can find. So we can talk more about that, but we have... We have to rethink the whole notion of how do you deal with conflict 
resolute. Last thing about young young pe people, uh, I remember in Soweto when I was here in the 80s, a conversation I had with uh, young kids on the street one day. I said, "Will your children ever breathe free air in South Africa?" Fourteen-year-olds looked me in the eye and said, I will see to it. I will see to it. When fourteen-year-olds talk about their children's future, I knew apartheid was finished. In time, it was finished. So it's only when young people take that responsibility for their future that change comes. Your job as a young person, part of your vocation, is to ask the hard questions that older people have a hard time asking. Because they get settled in families and jobs and responsibilities and careers and vocations. It is the obligation, the vocation of young people to ask the hard questions. And when you don't do that, we're in trouble. Make sense? Just a young thing also on the thing of, of how do we ensure that alumni go and really serve the common good. I think, Jim, at the university here, what we're trying to do is what we call science for society. We have graduate attributes, which amongst other others entail that we want our students to be responsible citizens who go out and, and, and serve the common good. And all the faculties at this university are really working hard to say, let us embody these graduate mm -hmm. attributes. They now even invited, all the deans invited the Faculty of Theology and Robert Forslow will, will be our leader in, in these negotiations mm -hmm. to talk about type of ethics course uh, for various faculties on the campus because the deans take the notion of, of serving the common good very, very seriously. So we hope that, that we can continue with the journey and then I really uh, when I read your words Jim one thing that struck me that I want to share and, uh, that gives me the energy to continue with what we're busy with is how you define hope we are the university also that tries to be a university of hope but listen to to uh, Jim's definition hope is believing in spite of the evidence then watching the evidence change. <laughs>